Okay. Welcome back. I see some people are not back in their seats yet, but they will be strolling in now. So, we started talking about the Euro crisis, and now we will go over to the growth crisis, or growth and competitiveness crisis, maybe we should call it. And for this, we have invited Bart van Ark, who is, well, maybe one of the world's leading experts on growth, I would say. Um, Bart is uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of the Conference Board, which is a global independent business membership and research association working in the public interest. Uh, I think the head office is uh, based in New York, so that's where Bart spends most of his days. But we are happy to, to have you here, so I think we're also a bit fortunate to have you here because you're usually on the other side, side of the Atlantic. So uh, please welcome Bart and enter the stage. Well, thank you. And um, oh, I have to switch it off. I guess. Yep. There we go. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I have to say that um, every time in the past two years that you have meetings on Europe, it is a pretty depressing uh, uh, event. I like the people, I like the coffee breaks and so on, but, uh, but the discussions are just absolutely uh, terrible. Not the quality of the discussions, but the content, obviously. And in this meeting, I think it's very explicit. We have an agenda with three types of crises. Uh, to talk about, um, and although we're all trying, and I will try that as well, to give a, a bit of a positive spin on it, it's clear that there are lots of challenges uh, to deal with. Now, I think of the free crisis we're talking about today, the, the euro crisis, the financial markets crisis, and the growth crisis, the growth crisis is perhaps one of the hardest uh, to deal with, and also perhaps one of the, the ones that is most critical for the future of Europe. That's not to sort of belittle the other problems we have, but as I said, for the Euro, about the Euro, we can have a debate whether we should go forward with it or backward or whatever. But the same is true with financial markets. We can talk about the institutions we need in the financial markets. And it's all very complicated and difficult. But for growth, there really isn't much of an alternative. Um, you know, we can talk about different types of growth, but it's clear that we need growth. And that's where the somewhat dramatic title in, uh, of my presentation comes from. Because growth is really going to determine whether Europe will... Uh, become again or will remain a global player in the global economy or whether it will become some kind of what I would say dinosaur of the past. Uh, and that dinosaur of the past concept is a, a physical concept because whatever happens to Europe it will remain a pretty rich part of the world, a very large part of the world. But if it doesn't grow as fast it will become a big consumer market with little dynamics, um, with little potential for further growth and ultimately a threat to the uh, increase of living standards in the longer term. So that's why this growth crisis really needs some attention. It's very hard to tackle because it, it takes a long time before we can actually revive growth in a more sustainable way. Now, uh, today is actually an interesting day for me to actually do this uh, presentation because every year we are releasing at the conference board our uh, annual productivity data and that's going to happen at 4 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, so you have the uh, privilege of getting a little bit of preview of the latest numbers we have. Uh, Philippe was earlier relating to the OECD numbers. These numbers are very much uh, comparable to that, except that we, uh, you know, as a private organization, have the advantage that we can actually make some estimates for 2013 and do a projection for 2014. So uh, there's a lot to talk about this chart. I could spend all my 20 minutes on this, which I'm not going to do, but the top chart is basically showing you the blue bar, the, uh, the um, uh, growth rate of GDP, the red bar, the growth rate of total hours worked, and then the green bar is uh, the, the growth rate of labor productivity. And what you can see is that, you know, that labor productivity growth, of course, has been coming down in the past couple of years. And, uh, but then, actually, when we look into 2014, the, the projections are indeed, you know, somewhat positive. We'll see a, a recovery of economic growth uh, in Europe. It's not, it's not a dramatic recovery, but, you know, that's the least that you might expect after two years of recession and after, actually, two uh, double-dip recessions. 
Uh, but even productivity may begin to pick up a little bit in going forward. But a lot of this might just be pro-cyclical, so we, we shouldn't get overexcited about this and push this point too hard. The economy is just coming out of a recession, and when you come out of a recession, productivity becomes pro-cyclical because output grows faster than employment, employment lags. So don't get overexcited, but it's a little bit of positive news. The more negative news is when you look at the bottom charts, it's a bit more complicated, but it's basically a growth accounting exercise where you basically decompose the output growth by the contributions of employment, the contributions of capital, and the contributions of what we call total factor productivity, which is kind of the remaining productivity after you take account of all the inputs. Now let me focus on that, because that the red part of that bar is what we call the total factor productivity. It's kind of the efficiency by which we are using our resources in the economy. And what you see there is actually not a, a, a great development. It's a little bit hard to see the years there, but it's basically sort of the uh, late 90s into the early 2000s, and then 2007 to 2011, and then you get 11, 12, and 13. And you can see that that red part has moved negative. Uh, so for Europe as a whole, we're now looking at negative total factor productivity growth. And as I will show you in a minute, that is actually a, a major concern in going forward, because it basically means that we're actually becoming less efficient in using our resources uh, in going forward. Here's the long-term trend. This is, this is, again, labor productivity, the simple concept of productivity. And I wanted to show this chart for two reasons. One is that there's this declining trend in labor productivity that's been going on in Europe for quite a while. So this is not just a crisis thing. This is something that we've had for about two decades. But I also wanted to show you the United States, because the United States also, that's the blue line, had similar kind of issues. It, it had a, a somewhat acceleration in its labor productivity growth trend, but also it's been slowing down. So Europe is not on its own. There is a bigger issue around productivity that's not just affecting, productivity, uh, that's not just affecting uh, Europe. Here you see total factor productivity again. And this is this sort of more uh, sophisticated concept of productivity. And here you can see that uh, you know, the US and Europe really perform differently. The US is kind of flat. I mean, it goes a little bit up and down. And there are concerns about productivity in the US right now. But you can see that the total factor productivity sort of remains reasonably positive. In Europe, it's a continuously declining line. So it means that on a trend basis, we are continuously getting worse at using our resources. Now, economists say this cannot go on for the simple reason that total factor productivity, at least for economists, is related to technological change. Well, technological change cannot be negative. It means we're moving backwards rather than forwards in, in technology. That cannot happen. Now, there's other stuff going on, like rigidities in markets and all these things that can make this happen. But clearly, we need to turn this trend around, because otherwise, this will ultimately grind uh, economic growth in the euro area to, uh, to a halt. Now, uh, I just wanted to pick a few countries. Again, this looks a little bit like a Christmas tree. You can just do that after the, uh, the holidays. But uh, I just wanted to compare a few countries here instead of looking at Europe as a whole. And that's important for the remainder of my story. Uh, because what you can really see here, and again, just focus on the total factor productivity <coughs> contributions, which are the, the red bars. So if you look at Poland and Germany, which are the two countries on the, on the left-hand side, and this is for the first part of the previous decade and the last part of the previous decade, you can see that the total factor productivity in those countries actually has increased. It has become better. So this productivity story is not a productivity story for all of Europe. It's a productivity story for some of the key countries in Europe. But Germany and Poland, they actually have been doing better in terms of their productivity performance. Well, Poland has declined, has slowed a little, but it's still a positive productivity growth rate. In the case of France, it has turned negative. In the case of Spain, it of course turned very negative. In the case of Sweden, where it was quite positive in the beginning of the decade, partly because of the IT uh, uh, revolution that has impacted uh, the Swedish economy very positively. It didn't in the second half of the decade, and it actually moved also negative. And then a country like the Netherlands, which has slower growth anyway, but also the total factor productivity growth becomes quite limited. So, so it really, if you want to understand Europe, you need to look at some of the individual countries on, on sort of what is going on here. Now, this is all about uh, the supply side of the economy. Now, the other thing to look at, because a lot of the discussion about Europe is about, and, and growth is about the supply side, it is useful to you also look at the demand side, because that's actually there's some positive uh, stories to be told there, and particularly at the foreign demand side. Because Europe is a relatively open economy. It's an economy that is very exposed to the rest of the world, much more than the United States. So looking at how Europe is engaging with the rest of the world is really important. Now, this is some recent work that comes from the University of Groningen, with which I still have some affiliation, which is looking at the value added that we are creating in different uh, 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 regions of the world uh, that is coming from exporting, uh, from uh, producing for uh, uh, global manufacturing production. 
So this is not just value added that's coming from the exporters in these regions. It is also all the value added of the suppliers to those exporters, the first and the second tier and so on. So it's all the economic activity that is there in order to supply manufacturing goods to the rest of the world. Now what you see here, actually for Europe, and this is only the EU 15, the old EU if you like, you can actually see that Europe has been doing quite well in this respect. Europe has actually exaggerated its exposure to the global economy in uh, most of the uh, uh, early 2000s. It of course was hit by the crisis, but since then it even started to recover again. So there's actually a good story to be told here as well, which is often forgotten about. This very open economy has a lot of potential to benefit what's going on in the rest of the world uh, in, in, in making sure that it is producing the products and services that the rest of the world requires. So I think this is important to keep in mind, and it will come back uh, later on in my story. Here's another way to look at that, which is the, the number of jobs that are being... Uh, oh, there's one thing I wanted to say. I mean, there's no reason for complacency here, right? Because I, I didn't talk about these countries at the bottom that are coming up, China, for example, that is very quickly catching up uh, in terms of producing value added for foreign, uh, for foreign production, and, and BRIM, which is basically the other major emerging markets like Brazil and Russia and India and Indonesia and Mexico, they're also catching up. So no reason for complacency, but there is a good story to be told here. The other good story to be told here is the number of jobs that are actually related to that production for foreign, uh, uh, for foreign manufacturing. And here you can see, of course, a lot of these jobs are manufacturing jobs, which are the red parts of these Bukhar. And you can see that, in fact, the EU15 is creating more jobs. These are just thousands of workers uh, um, uh, that are actually creating more jobs for foreign production than the United States, for example. But what's also interesting is the blue part of this bar, which are the non-manufacturing jobs. Those are the services jobs, particularly in the economy. So it's not just manufacturing jobs that are producing for the global economy, but particularly in advanced economies, and Sweden is a very good example of that, it are services jobs that are producing for the global economy. And again, Europe has been doing quite well, because you see that the blue part of the service job has actually increased over time. Right? So on the, on the demand side, really a, good story, uh, uh, really a good story to be told. So this is kind of what we know until now. This is what I would say we know pre-crisis. On the supply side, we have uh, some real problems Big productivity growth, a lot of that is related to IT and the lack of IT applications. We talked about that before, but there's a lot more going on than that. Uh, we actually had some good employment growth in Europe, some of that uh, related to producing for foreign production. Um, uh, we had a divergence of labor cost uh, taking place that was referred to also early in discussion. I didn't spend some time on that. And then on the demand side, we have uh, some good stories to be told. Uh, greater income from the global value chain. Uh, the share of income that's coming from the services sector is uh, benefiting here in particular. And also, again, I didn't talk about this, but a lot of the income that is coming from the global value chain is actually going to the, to the high and the medium skilled jobs, which are sort of the good jobs in the economy. So you want to have more of that. So that's sort of where we were before, uh, before, we, uh, got into, uh, before we got into the crisis. Now, what I want to do now is say, where is this all going? And, and, and I showed you earlier these individual countries, because the, the, the point that I want to sort of uh, pursue here is the idea that indeed there are different Europes. And that's not necessarily a problem to have different Europes. You don't have to worry about it. But if we're not, uh, you know, if you take the United States, there are many different states in the United States. But if we don't understand how these different parts of Europe are working, we actually are going to prescribe sort of uh, uh, policy fit for all type of policies instead of understanding that countries are doing things in different ways. So I'm going to describe four major regions in the world, uh, sorry, in the, in the European area, in Europe, four major regions in Europe, groupings of countries, and then I'll show you some numbers related to the numbers I showed you earlier that make the point that these groupings are really different. So the first group is basically what I would call the integrated value chain. So this is essentially Germany, but not just Germany. It includes Austria, and very importantly, it, it includes some of the major countries in Central and Eastern Europe. So this is uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic. Um, these are probably the examples of sort of the most integrated value chain that we perhaps even have in the world. I mean, these countries are incredibly integrated. The main reason for Germany's success, well, the main reason, one very important reason for Germany's success, is that it has been able to offshore a lot of its labor to those economies so that Germany could move itself up into the value chain. There's more going on in Germany, the Mittelstand arguments so are playing an important role, but I think this value chain kind of story is very, very important for Germany's success. Germany's success is not Germany's success. Germany's success is the success of the value chain it has created, in particular with Austria and major parts of Central and Eastern Europe. 
That part of the world actually does have one problem, which I will come back to, and that is a demographic problem. If there's one group of countries where we actually see the demography mm -hmm. turning negative in terms of negative population growth rates and slow growth of the labor force, it's that part of the world. But I'll come back to that. The second group is a little bit of an odd group, but when you talk about it, you begin to recognize that they have a lot in common. And it basically, I call this the arc of small economies, nothing related to the name. Um, and that's, that basically starts sort of in Northwestern Europe, the Baltic states, and then of course all the Nordic countries, uh, but also the Benelux and Ireland, I would include in that as well. All small economies, open economies, uh, very large export to GDP ratios, quite often strong competitive advantages in particular sectors of the economy. Uh, not as integrated in the value chain as Germany is, much more arm's length trade and foreign direct investment, but not this concept of the value chain being so strongly. Uh, many of, con of these companies have uh, characteristics uh, like that. Competitive export sectors, also what many of these countries have in common, is that they have a relatively liberalized services market, domestic services market. Not all of them, but if you compare them with Germany, for example, most of these economies have much more liberalized and flexible services markets than is the case in, in other parts of the countries. The fourth group is basically one country, and that's the UK. And the UK essentially is what I call the ultimate deindustrialization model. If you look at the share of manufacturing in the UK, it has significantly declined over time. Productivity growth is a major uh, issue in going forward. And also when you look at the share of employment beyond manufacturing, so even the services employment that produces for the foreign markets, again, the UK is sort of on the lower end of the site. It's an economy that increasingly gets, tends to uh, thrive on the basis of services. Domestic services, the financial sector, of course, is a very important part of that, uh, with some foreign exposure. Uh, but it is a model that, uh, that is really distinctly different, as I will show in a minute, from what we see in other parts of Europe. And then finally, there's a, a, a group that I would call the inward looking group, or the Mediterranean group, which thankfully, by definition, includes France. Not, I didn't just put it there, actually the numbers conform to it, but it also is by definition part of the Mediterranean. Uh, companies that are more dependent on their domestic economies that actually have <coughs> dropped off on their exposure to, uh, uh, to the global economy. They have been less exposed to the global economy rather than more, uh, as was the case in Germany and other parts of the world. They have one advantage, and that is they have more positive demographics, which for the future could be quite important. Okay, now this is all based on a study that we did for the European Commission. Um, let me just show you uh, quickly some numbers here, comparing those four groups and the EU27. So this is looking, and we, every time we're comparing the first part of the previous decade and the second part of the previous decade, the cutoff is 2006, so it's kind of the peak. So you can see what happened up to the peak, and then you can see what happened after we passed the peak. So first of all, what you can see on GDP growth, this is just the GDP charts, you can see that the only region that actually had an improvement in GDP growth since 2006 was the integrated value chain, the Germany plus group. Right? All the other regions showed a slowdown. In GDP growth. But again, not all the countries, but the integrated value chain was a clear exception to this. Also, when it comes to GDP per capita, so this is average income, same story. It's the industry, it's the integrated value chain that shows the improvement. All the other regions are showing a slowdown in GDP per capita. And when it comes to GDP per hour, which is labor productivity, uh, you can see that you know, even though the integrated value chain also showed some slowdown in productivity growth in the second half of the decade, that slowdown wasn't nearly as fast as it was in the uh, other regions that you're looking at. Here is some of the growth accounting work, and again, you can see here, and I showed that already a little earlier when we looked at uh, the total factor productivity, again, the red bars, you can see that the integrated value chain, the second, the, the third, and the fourth bar, that the integrated value chain was able to maintain positive total factor productivity growth whereas all the other major groupings actually moved into negative productivity growth. So it's the same story as I told you earlier. And here's another way of looking at that global value chain. And this is a, a chart that is looking at the employment share in the manufacturing sector of jobs that are exposed to producing for the foreign market. So same story as I told you earlier. This is about jobs in manufacturing, not just export jobs, but all jobs that contribute to the global value chain. So these things change very slowly over time, but you, again, you can see that in the integrated value chain, the number of manufacturing jobs that contributed positively has increased, whereas in all of the other regions, it has actually slowed down, including the global niche players, where the export sector is such a relatively large share of the economy. Well, this is manufacturing jobs, but it gets more interesting when we look at the non-manufacturing jobs, where again, you can see that the integrated value chain has been able to rapidly increase its numbers of service sector jobs that are contributing to the global value chain. 
also the global niche players have been doing reasonably well, going back to my story that their services markets are actually performing reasonably well, and that is paying off in terms of the number of service sector jobs that pr produce the foreign production. Uh, in the deindustrialization model in the UK, it's mainly financial jobs that we're looking at here. And in the inward-looking jobs, the number of jobs contributing has actually declined as a share of the total number of non-manufacturing jobs. So again, there's distinctly different behavior between uh, these different groups. And then finally, when you look forward, we are doing some projections of growth performance at the conference board. So this is now looking at sort of five years and ten years ahead. Uh, you can see a, a, a very interesting story emerging, and that is that the integrated value chain and the global niche players, they will actually be able to continue after we get through all this mess of the crisis, they'll be able to continue a reasonably good pace in terms of productivity growth, the red part. Their problem is demographics, particularly in the integrated value chain. You can see that the blue part of those bars is actually moving negative. And this is a challenge that the integrated value chain and to a lesser extent the global niche players have. And that is that, you know, on the one hand, we're growing productivity, but do, are we able to actually, you know, accelerate our job growth? Are we able to deal with the slowing uh, of our population growth? And isn't that taking away some of the dynamics of economic growth? The challenges in the denocialization model and the inward-looking model are quite different. There, the real problem is really how can we drive productivity growth in going forward? So very different models. And again, I'm, the, the reason why I'm showing you these different models is not basically to tell the story, well, you know, uh, we, need to, we all need to become the same. I think this is perhaps one of the mistakes that has been made in the growth debate, is that there's this argument that everybody needs to become like Germany. I don't think that's a good idea. You know, not all the states in the United States are, thank the Lord, like California. Uh, that would not be a good thing. So you don't have to be all like Germany, but some countries perhaps might like to become a little bit more like Germany. That would already help uh, to sort of change things considerably. But we need to understand these differences in the growth models that these various countries have. Now, there's some policy implications for that that we can talk about, uh, but I'm going to skip that because I really want to spend my last slide on looking forward uh, on economic growth. Because this is a time of huge uncertainty. This is a time where we don't quite know where economic growth in Europe is going to head. So we need to really begin to think about what are the different scenarios that Europe may be facing and how are these going to play out. And my argument is that there are basically two dimensions that are really important to look at that, of course, come back from the story that I've been telling so far. The first scenario is basically, is Europe going to invest or is Europe going to fail to invest? That's kind of the vertical dimension here. And by investment, I'm not just talking about are we going to invest in machinery and equipment and in buildings, but are we going to invest in people? Are we going to invest in innovation and R&D? Are we going to invest in organizations? Are we going to invest in what I would call the intangibles of economic growth? Are we freeing up those resources? Are we schooling our people to do this or not? Are we making, uh, are we making that uh, going to happen? So that's the one dimension that we really need to think about. It's a very important driver of productivity growth in the longer term, it's investment dimension. The other dimension is what you could call the reform or the integration dimension. I focus this very much on the need for this European single market. The European single market is incomplete. In manufacturing, it's relatively complete, but we have continuous challenges. Just think about IT, and you already can think about the challenges we have there. But certainly in the services market of the European economy, the uh, integration agenda is very incomplete, and that can have very different outcomes for uh, the uh, performance of uh, the European Union. And again, integration doesn't mean everybody has to become the same. Integration actually means that you're going to benefit from the diversity that I have just been describing in, in my earlier, uh, in my earlier uh, uh, distinction between the various regions. So what are the possible outcomes if you use those two dimensions, the vertical investment, the uh, horizontal integration? Well, um, let's start perhaps with the two uh, simplest ones. At the uh, left bottom, that's the real crisis one. So let's start with the crisis one. We get that one out of the way. That is basically we're not going to invest and we're not going to further integrate. The implications of that is going to be that we are going to basically get 27 or 28, where are we now? I think 28 down. This I wrote this a, a little while ago. 28 home markets that are actually becoming much more inward looking and are not able to benefit from the advantage of scaling uh, up. It means that austerity uh, programs will 
begin to be very focused on reducing state budgets, make it very imp uh, hard to continue to invest in education and R&D. It means higher unemployment uh, and, and a slow and defensive integration uh, of EU markets where possible, and, and it won't happen in other parts of the uh, uh, in other parts of, uh, of major uh, industries. It means that services and IT-driven activities have to be focused on smaller markets, which is one of the key problems in Europe, is that IT cannot scale up, and which is one of the main reasons why all the Google and the Apples, as Philip described before, in the United States. The market is simply significantly better, and, and bigger, I should say. Uh, that is what is failing in Europe, and that's kind of the model you're going to end up with in that, uh, in that situation. Also, very important, a fragmented EU will have a really hard time to be a global player, politically, but also economically. You know, you know the stories about China, and it's been confirmed every time you go to China, that there are just no 28 countries China can focus on. They want to deal with the EU, that is kind of the kind of power they are looking at, and they can do business with. On the other side, we've got a really optimistic story. That's a, a, a story, well, in, in some ways an optimistic story. I should be careful here. An, a story of investment and integration. That is what I would call differentiated integration. Now, of course, we create a lot of scale, but we also create a lot of turmoil. Because in that environment of integration and investment, we'll get a lot of disruption and displacement. There will be winners and losers. This is the impact of structural reform. And you know, when we talk about European elections, I do think that you know, when we talk about reforms and talk about investment, we have to also tell the story that that is not always going to be easy because people will lose their jobs and other people will get their jobs. And industries will move out of one country and move into another country. So the differentiated integration model sounds great in the longer term and the growth effects are by far the most positive compared to the other scenarios. But certainly it's not an easy scenario, and certainly not an easy scenario to sell to an already very critical electorate that we're going forward. So don't necessarily drive that story all the way down, because to my earlier point, I think you may lose rather than win the elections with that model. So the two other uh, 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 scenarios are a little bit more complex in the sense that we could uh, invest in, uh, in, in our economies but fail to really pursue our integration agenda well, if that happens, then we could end up in a situation that we get more government spending uh, in education and R&D and in infrastructure. But the real problem here is that we have that lack of market integration and that there will be industries, particularly industries that are very dependent on skill, that will not be able to succeed in that kind of environment. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, and that means that you know, you'll get some uh, large uh, global players, so some large companies that actually uh, will uh, operate much more outside Europe than inside Europe. We already see some of those effects where some large, very successful European, company, uh, European companies have now much bigger markets outside the EU than inside the EU and, and see that trend actually continuing and going forward. And then finally on the right hand side we get the model of what I would call powerless unity, that is that we do integrate but we are just driving so heavily on our austerity programs and getting our budgets in order that we're falling behind in terms of making these investments in, in the European economy. So I think, you know, we have to entertain these different scenarios. We cannot go on by just talking about crisis only and therefore we're ending up in the 27 or 28 home markets. We also have to be careful not to just push the story of the European intellectual elite that is basically saying we need to free up the markets and we need to further integrate because it's a story that really uh, uh, needs to be told very carefully in terms of the impacts that it has on the economy. Um, so let me stop there. I think that might perhaps give us some uh, food for thought uh, during, the, uh, during the panel discussion um, and, uh, and see where we, where we go from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I could have some help with the tables here. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. There was quite a few things, especially the ones where you divided up the countries in four different, different categories. That was very interesting to me. Uh, never thought of it that way before. Uh, I would like a panel now. Uh, and on this panel, I will have uh, Pontus Garniem. Uh, Managing Director of the Swedish Enterprise Forum and uh, also Professor at the Royal Institute of Technology. And we also cooperate on a project right now. Uh, I will also have Lena Hagman, Chief Economist at Almega. And uh, Harald Edqvist, who is Research Director at Forest. 
welcome up all of you. So, maybe we'd like you would like to start with initial short comments on what Bart just told us. Someone who has spontaneous comment, Pontus. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Bart, for an interesting uh, presentation, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, for natural reasons, there has been a lot of focus on stabilization policies, given the crisis that Europe and the global economy has been into for the last five to six years. Uh, that has been governed relatively well, I think, from the European perspective, at least when it comes to monetary policies, then we can discuss fiscal policies. But uh, uh, what has been suffering, I would say, is growth policies. And one reason, in my uh, view, is that um, the growth model is far too simplistic. It does not actually provide very good guidance for our politicians. Um, the current growth model is very much directed towards knowledge investments, uh, knowledge accumu accumulation, and that means uh, R&D, basically, and education to some extent. Now, of course, of course that is critically important. It is a necessary ingredient, ingredient in growth, but it, it, it is far from sufficient. The more important part actually has to do, do with how do we diffuse knowledge? How is knowledge coming into use? How is knowledge converted into societal value? And that's a whole other set of policies. That has to do with uh, taxes, uh, with uh, regulations, uh, uh, with innovation policies, etc. And that is very often disregarded or put at the second ranking, so to speak, related to the knowledge investment. And this is where I think uh, uh, Europe has to be much stronger. And it, what it actually boils down to is, and I think uh, Bart touched upon this too uh, in his presentation, of course, uh, the uh, the structural reform agenda. And we have seen that fail before in the so-called Lisbon process. <laughs> um, the um, performance was quite mediocre, actually. Now we have something called Europe 2020. We have an innovation union. We have seven flagships. We need that uh, concept of Europe 2020. But what is actually going on there? Um, and I think here is where we have to gather force, really. Uh, so that, these are my general comments. And I'd like to come back to a few things that you mentioned in your presentation. Lena, please. Yeah. Uh, since I'm a macroeconomist uh, making forecasts for uh, Almega, uh, I would like to comment on what's really happening right now. I'm very focused in the, the Swedish economy regarding those questions about the financial crisis and also investments. And uh, so far, uh, since uh, the big uh, down uh, fall uh, of investments in 2008. They haven't really recovered yet uh, in Sweden. We have seen a downward trend in growth rates during the past two years. And I've seen this as a, this is uh, uh, not like it used to be back in, in the previous recoveries in the many decades, like in the 60s or in the 90s, or uh, really, it, it actually investments used to recover much faster in recoveries. But now uh, we are in a, this long period uh, uh, being affected by the financial crisis. So it usually, it takes longer time, but uh, th those investments that are so important to uh, to make uh, uh, innovations uh, uh, come uh, to, to increase uh, productivity growth and total factor productivity, they haven't really picked up yet in Sweden. So I think uh, uh, we might now witness a, an extreme structural change in the Swedish economy and maybe also in other co economies because uh, during those past few years, we, s we have seen a continuing uh, 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 decrease of employment in the manufacturing industry in Sweden. Uh, at the same time, uh, as Bart uh, dis explained, uh, what kind of jobs that have been growing is in the service sector, 
uh, in connection with the structural change, the s service industries contribute to the Swedish, Sweden's uh, export growth. Uh, but <laughs> uh, we haven't seen those uh, investments pick up. And at the same time, uh, uh, last year, we still had a very slow growth in the Swedish economy, but the employment started to pick up. And every economy, economist here is very confused how that could come, uh, why, <laughs> in this phase of the, the uh, pickup. Uh, and we, from Almega, we, we think that we have the answer uh, because uh, we have already a demographic problem in Sweden. We have already uh, seen in the last few years many um, elder, the, the <laughs> uh, uh, retiring, uh, quite a lot of people have already retired. And we see this, uh, this has aggravated uh, the shortages of skills in the labor market. So the companies, especially in the service sector, they have started to uh, employ more, uh, expecting the recovery to come. But to do this more earlier than before, than usual, because we already have a big problem here. And uh, I think it's so important also, let me finish on, uh, continue this importance of those um, investments in innovation, research and development and uh, intangibles. Um, I think I'm also worried that the, those new regulations uh, uh, put on the banks uh, now with the new uh, Basel III regulations, they don't uh, take, take into consideration the importance of investments for the companies to get loans to borrow money to invest in intangible intangibles. It's much harder for companies to get those uh, finances because, and especially I think, is there is a risk if politicians don't see the importance of those intangible investments uh, and if the companies will have a problem to get cre uh, finances for that, to borrow, fan finance such investments. Uh, we, that will also put a drag on, on the recovery. So it's, it's all fit together. So it's so important to understand for politicians. They can do something here too, and they should take into consideration when they put up new regulations for banks in this respect too. Uh, Thank you. After having heard your uh, presentation, I think it's, uh, uh, I think, a lot of countries in Europe uh, need. Can you can you hear me? My or is that for? Now you can hear me. Uh, I think that the recipe for many countries in Europe uh, are product market reforms and and labor market reforms. And there, I also think that actually product market reforms, as Philip was arguing here before, is more important than labor market reforms when it comes to productivity development. While labor market reforms will be more important for restoring or increasing the employment rate in, in these countries. Then I also think that, that coming out from this um, presentation, we also need to discuss what the ins how we can, can improve incentives to innovate in Europe. And finally, I also think it's very important to, to think a little bit about the public sector that is much larger in most European countries than compared to, the, for example, the US. And here it's very important, I think, that, that we start discussing how, we, how can we measure the, the outcome of the public sector, because this would be very important to, to remain competitive for European countries. Actually, I guess measuring it differently it doesn't really change the productivity, but it changes the, the way we put it forward. So I think I, it's, yeah. it's uh, to be able to say anything about yeah. productivity development in the public sector, yeah. we need to improve measurement. Yeah. M might it be that <laughs> some of the difference between Europe and the US is actually a, a problem with measurements, that we have such big public sectors in, in Europe and 
we don't measure it correctly. I mean, you, you see large differences also if you look at at the, at the private sector, where the U.S. Mm -hmm. over as, as Bart showed, uh, has been more successful. As a matter of fact, uh, there are measurement problems, of course, in the public sector, but the, the imperfect measure that you're suggesting that, if anything, Europe is not doing worse than the United States in the public sector. Can you imagine healthcare in the US, uh, education? Uh, if anything, they might even be doing better. The real problem in Europe is actually the market sector of the economy, where we actually yeah. have better measures. Yeah. Pontus. Uh, but you did display in, in your graphs here, and I, I noticed that the, they were labeled Europe, and then in the graph you had EU. Mm. So it means that we are actually in terra incognita right now because we, we doesn't fit in there. I, well, you're part of the EU. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're part, part of the okay. Euro area. The Euro. Yes. <laughs> the Euro you had in there in yeah. your diagrams. The Euro area. Anyway, um, you show that there is a huge increase in particularly the service employment in some of the groups and some of the countries Correct. that you displayed. And there, and this relates very much to the point by, by Horrell here, of course, that there is where we also have problems in, in measuring productivity. So how much of that would be explained when you look at the uh, pretty poor performance in labor productivity, some extent, in, in the total Those package. measures that I was showing there were actually all market sector. So in, in, there were total economy measures there, but when we looked at sort of the share of manufacturing versus non-manufacturing, you're talking about the market sector of the economy. The market sector, yeah. but still even there in the service sector, it's 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 more difficult to. Yeah, that's I mean, true. But you know, if you have increased competition, lower prices of, right. of services, sure. that would show up as a negative productivity. Sure. Sure. So, uh, on what levels do we need solutions, or on what levels will we see solutions? We uh, Europe 2020 has been brought up here a couple of times. Uh, Will we see solutions on the EU level to the growth and productivity problems, or has it, does it have to be on the national level? Can, can the EU, I mean, the, the Lisbon process didn't really, uh, it wasn't really a big success. Uh, will it be any better in the future? Well, I, I think actually that there we are making a bit of progress uh, to, to the, the minister's comment citing Barroso, you know, Europe needs to get better at, at the big things. and tries not to do the small things is you know the startup of a debate and say there's a lot of stuff that is much better dealt with at the country level than at an EU level and again the US model is of course very useful here particularly when it comes to services sector uh, regulation a lot of it is actually done at the state level when it comes to labor market regulation a lot of it is done at the state level uh, what's done at the federal level is indeed financial markets uh, and uh, mobility uh, uh, across states and integration um, so I, I think we're actually making some progress of not getting this blanket solution, you know, that Europe needs to be every, needs to do everything in order to drive uh, growth policy. So I think that's a good development. Okay. I'd like to ask Bart. Um, you mentioned uh, Germany and and the uh, states, uh, countries clustered around Germany as as good examples in in many ways. At the same time, I would argue that Germany also has some responsibility and not least because they have been on the winning side in this whole euro project um, don't you see uh, that there are also room for for reform for a reform agenda uh, within these countries and particularly in germany well i always find it hard to go to a, a the most successful economy, at least at this time uh, in Europe, that actually has made some of the major reforms back in the 2000s. And to Mrs. Merkel credit, she has actually given that credit to Schroeder, who has put through these, mm. uh, these changes, the, reforms uh, the hard reforms yeah. in the early 2000s, um, to actually criticize that country. Now, look, you've been so successful that now you, take, you need to take your responsibility and actually slow things down a little in order so that others get a chance. So, um, you know, of course, Germany uh, seems Germany needs more consumption and needs more domestic mm. demands. Um, and actually, you know, even though the business sector is criticizing the new government, actually some of the new measures that are being taken are probably going to do that. I think that's the purpose of uh, of this. My main problem with Germany is, as I also described during my presentation, is that Germany is saying everybody else needs to do exactly what we do. Now, that doesn't recognize the fact that structures of the economy are very, very different, uh, that it doesn't make sense for Greece to become like Germany, or even though, as I also said, I mean, there are some elements of the German success that Greece certainly could benefit from. So, yeah, I, I do think that Germany needs to take its responsibility, but it needs to take it in the right places, uh, which is indeed try to do a little bit more to get the domestic economy uh, uh, growing faster. Uh, and describe the right lessons to the rest of Europe rather than just try to 
um, you know, emulate the German model across the European Union. As I said, you know, we don't all want to be like California and the United States, so mm. we also don't want all to be like Germany. But, but uh, is Germany actually so successful? Because, I mean, quite a part of the productivity growth has been because of lower wage growth. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's probably a one-off. You, you can't keep wages down forever. Yeah, I think that is that is a very good point, uh, and that is that one thing that the hearts reforms have done is that they have created this room for low wage labor, um, which has been much more an issue for the domestic economy because that's you know a lot of these are service section jobs. Those are the people who have now very low wages, therefore very low incomes, and don't really consume as much as they should. Um, so that's that's a, a downside that I think needs to begin to change. On the other hand, you know this on, on, on the other end where you know, technology uh, and innovation is taking place, that kind of labor market reforms were absolutely necessary. But I would argue that Germany has been doing a better job in sort of um, uh, neutralizing those effects of innovation and technology, for example, the United States. So again, I would describe you know, Germany probably following their more useful path uh, or a more profitable path going forward in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a bit about labor reforms and market reforms and uh, product market reforms because uh, Harald, you, you actually said that uh, you think that the product market reforms are more needed than labor market reforms. But I mean, at the same time, uh, Europe is often described as having very, very strict labor market rules. I, I, I'm thinking a little bit about uh, the case Sweden here, that, that we have done a lot of product market reforms and not that much on, on labor markets, though we have allowed for temp agencies uh, and so on. So, so we are, it's not as regulated right. for temporary contracts in Sweden, but kind of reg regulated in terms of... But, I, I, but, but, but Sweden has been successful, and, and it, then it seems to be... For Sweden, it seems to have been a successful strategy, at least, to, to, to just focus more on product market reforms. Yeah, but uh, I think that's actually where the distinction between the various groups comes out very useful, because all these groups that are part of that arc of small countries have done a lot more in the product market reforms. This is true for Sweden, it's true for all the Nordic countries, it's true for most of the Benelux, more for the Netherlands than for Belgium. Uh, but all of them have been fairly successful in doing that. Some of the larger economies, for example France, uh, still has a lot of product market reforms to do. Um, so I think it's a very different model across countries. I think where a lot of the small countries are now suffering from is that the lack of labor market reforms is now creating this problem of outsiders and insiders in the labor market and making it very hard to, uh, to move forward in terms of getting you know, the right people in the right place. So I, I think it really depends on, on the countries. So the, the southern countries like Greece and Italy, so would they need they, more of labor market reforms? They have done, Spain, for example, has done an enormous amount of labor market reforms as, as a result of the crisis. But when you look at the, the product market reforms, I think Spain is way behind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, let me <laughs> come to your uh, very positive scenarios for the Nordic region uh, when it comes to uh, total factor productivity growth and, and the demographic development. I think it must be based on very po special assumptions about the politics that will uh, invest then in, in uh, more skilled labor or uh, I don't know. <laughs> Because I see uh, it, there is a, a great risk now that uh, politicians, they count on that uh, when the recovery finally will come, they think that everything will be as normal again uh, and the manufacturing industry will uh, recover with uh, employment maybe or uh, I don't know. But it will not, uh, we will not come back to that kind of uh, manufacturing uh, way because the manufacturing industry will need more than ever uh, to the subcontractors of very um, uh, very highly skilled uh, services that deliver those also from uh, the Swedish uh, companies but also from uh, service industries abroad so the service industry is now already facing uh, uh, growing competition from uh, service produ producers abroad. And we cannot take for granted that our uh, export industry will, will stay and invest in Sweden if they don't get the, the, the most uh, competitive uh, um, service deliveries from our uh, companies here in Sweden. So this is a new 
uh, face for the service industry. It, it's not protected. Uh, it's more also competing on the export market. Uh, so I think we cannot take for granted that everything will come back to normal and we will have a very strong productivity growth here. It depends so much on the supply of very skilled labor and that we can solve the mismatch in the labor market and, and not just uh, try to solve the problem for those who, who are very, don't have uh, uh, a very low education. We have to increase the supply of very educated personnel. So this is... Uh, yeah, I was certainly <laughs> not trying to argue that um, integrated value chain countries and the global niche countries uh, have no problems in going forward. Uh, as, and you made that point yourself, one of the main problems that these countries have is slowing demographics, uh, therefore slowing growth in the labor force, therefore slowing income growth. So uh, what you will see in some of these economies is that, you know, and for services that's important because you've got many different services. You've got services producing for the foreign market, but you've got also producers, uh, services producing for the domestic market. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are, I think, really suffering in terms of, you know, how can they develop a business model in, a, in, a, in an environment where actually population growth and labor force growth is, is slowing. One of the problems I have if, um, one of the, the questions I think I would have if um, uh, the need in those sectors for, as you, as you argue, both of you argued on investment in uh, intangibles, which I would totally agree with, is exactly what the policies are uh, that, that make that useful. That's the point, you know, the, the only reason why we're so focused on R&D is it's quite easy. I mean, you just, you know, you give tax credits and subsidies and things like that, but when it comes to organizational innovation, so whenever it comes to investing in training, you know, the question immediately arises, you know, should the government really step in, or should we just have a competitive market, and then the successful companies will make the investment and the non-successful will not. So I think that's, that's a real question. What is the policy agenda for the services sector? No, I think Pontus actually should answer that because you, you brought it up in the beginning that you see a lot of knowledge production now, you, you see a lot of research, but you, you have to see it come to productive work as well. How should there be done, anything done politically, and, in, and then what? I think there is a whole set of things that could be done politically, but uh, very much focus has been on, as I mentioned, you know, you have the three percent target when it comes to, to R and D in percentage of uh, the EU's uh, GDP. Uh, but and that is important. But then, how is that converted into societal use? And that has to do, as I said, with incentives, and then you're looking at taxes, taxes. it has to do with regulations. It's a whole set of, of uh, policy measures that has to be undertaken that are complementary to the knowledge upbuilding, the knowledge investments. And that is um, where, the, where the present growth mo model is flawed, I would say. You know? So we, we emphasize the first part too much. Uh, I don't think you can single out one particular measure that should be that sort of uh, decisive. You need several of them. And I have argued before that we should have some sort of an innovation policy framework, a little bit similar to fiscal or monetary policy frameworks, that sort of guarantees a, a long-term view on these. And that policy should be based on a couple or three, four pillars, something like that. Um, that is what I think is needed. So it, it provides the market with certainty. Then I think there may be another risk. We know that the financial sector is, is critically important for growth as well. Um, I had Peter Schiller at the KTO when he was in, in Stockholm, and he, he talked about his latest book about the importance of innovation in financial markets. What is happening now? I mean, are we over-regulating? Uh, is there policy pressure to, to really guide every step? We have a very complex system, the financial market. Should that be... Uh, governed by another complex set of regulations. Well, research seems to indicate that that is not the optimal way of uh, um, having an efficient uh, financial market. So I think, you know, there, there's not just one thing. You have to look at the whole set of policy uh, measures that must be taken in order to promote more growth. I also had a, um, a point on, on R&D. Uh, it's very important to look at the structure of R&D too. If you look at Sweden, for example, the 10 largest companies in Sweden account for 55% of total investment in R&D uh, in, in the private sector. So this makes Sweden very vulnerable. 
And I know there are <laughs> programs in the United States where certain amounts of the, the, the R&D spending by the government has to go to firms that are small or medium-sized. What do, I'm asking this question in this panel. Do you think this is a good idea? No, I was um, going to point to no. some of the other people. Yeah. <laughs> but do you think on Harald's question, is it a good idea? Well, I have... It sounds very good. <laughs> but uh, I think um, uh, it, it's a, a big question mark now with all the regulations of the financial uh, sector. Uh, how it will uh, uh, affect the smaller companies and innovative companies in uh, in being able to finance their innovation investments and we haven't really seen those investments pick up yet so we don't know and and it doesn't it isn't really discussed during those uh, discussions about how to regulate this financial sector I think I haven't I, I asked I for more research in this and to, to look into this and, and politicians to take this into account uh, to understand it's more uh, risky for banks uh, to to uh, to to give give uh, or let uh, smaller companies that are are young innovative to to get uh, loans they don't have these collateral the uh, like uh, s machines and other uh, fixed capital to to rely on to they have this mostly human capital <coughs> and it, it's more uh, usually it it, it um, demands a higher uh, risk and higher uh, interest rates to borrow money uh, for those kinds of investments and I think uh, we have seen the larger companies they have saved more money in recent years to, to build up buffers in order to be able to invest in intangibles because they know it, it's more uh, expensive to, to borrow money for those kinds of investments. So, but what about the, the smaller companies? It will be more difficult for them, I suspect, uh, to get uh, loans for that. I, I think there is there's no doubt that um the conditions and the constraints for the banking sector are working out very negatively for small and medium-sized enterprises. It's just very hard and it also relates to lack of innovation in the banking sector to come up with good models to help small and medium-sized enterprises. So there's no doubt that that needs to change. And that's very different and from the US or... Well, it has, uh, mind you, there also there has been, uh, has been a lot of reluctance to, uh, to uh, uh, lend to small and medium-sized enterprises, but it's beginning to change and, and you know, the banking sector is much more diverse uh, there's a lot more sort of local banking that is much more tied in with small and medium-sized business that sort of makes these things possible. So I mean that the whole financial market is just significantly deeper and therefore mm. makes it possible to uh, integrate, uh, to, to, to develop these models. Whereas in Europe we have all this fragmentation and lack of integration of the banking market. So, so I think that definitely matters. The second point is that to me the most important policy for the success of small and medium enterprises is labor market and product market reforms. The most the most issues that the small and medium sized enterprises uh, uh, complain about is lack of bar or is, is huge barriers in order to grow into particular product markets and it is very difficult to hire and fire in, in many countries. But there's a third element and I think that's perhaps the hardest and it's the non-economic argument that some people call this entrepreneurship but you know to a large extent it is a cultural issue about are we willing to accept and this goes to my, my very positive scenario of an, of an integrated EU with a lot of reforms and a lot of investment it's a lot of turmoil and it's a lot of disruption and you know US businesses and US entrepreneurs are willing to accept that kind of turmoil I mean they start a company if it fails they can be allowed to fail and they start over again and you can literally see it happen that and even in this recovery from the crisis you see people trying over and over again to find a new model and I am not sure that in Europe we are really willing to accept that kind of disruption. And again, I think in the run-up to the uh, parliamentary elections, this is going to be an important debate. Are you really willing to sell that concept of turmoil and mess and disruption uh, in the economy? And is that something that the voter will go for? So I think there is a cultural issue that we really need to think about very hard. Mm. Another I think that's important no. also. It's not one size fits all, but I, I think each nation has to build on it, its tradition and to find its path 
to a more dynamic and, and entrepreneurially innovative economy. That, that, that's part of the dynamic game, I would say. And I guess another part of this, probably related culturally, is that we, we like to have a lot of welfare in, in Europe. And uh, is this possible in the future with the competition that Europe faces? Can, can we keep our big welfare sectors or do we have to So I, I think change? one, we need to look at some other models in Europe, you know. Let's look at Canada. Let's look at Australia. Mm. Some countries are a little bit in between the extreme of the US in terms of volatility and the European model. And not everything is perfect in those parts of the world either, but it seems that somehow they can sort of balance a more competitive type of environment with a with a welfare state that works reasonably well. So I do think that there are models uh, to learn from. But even those changes towards those kind of models will remain, will, will imply disruptions. Yeah. There is a, a well-known researcher, Asimoglu, who I think in his latest book discusses this and he calls it, he frames it, uh, cuddly competition or cutthroat competition. And the US and the Anglo-Saxon countries, mostly they uh, are engaged in cutthroat. And it, what, what it shows there is that it's all right if we stick to the more cuddly sort of compet uh, competition and, and uh, sort of markets as long as someone else is doing the cutthroat competitive part. But if all are doing it, it wouldn't work you in terms of. else in the country or other countries? Other countries. Oh, okay. If all are adopting the same sort of uh, system, then that would deteriorate. We Those can't all be quite like the US. Uh, Right, yeah, well, rather become like the US, but not like uh, the welfare, the cuddly states. You can't all become like them if you're not able to accept, not willing to accept a substantial cut in, in uh, GDP growth. As long as the US keeps innovate, innovating, we can we hang on. Benefit from that. Benefit too. from that. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. So, to some extent, yeah. yes. Yeah. So uh, transfer that message. <laughs> uh, I would like to go back to to the, the four categories that you split up Europe in. Uh, is it inevitable that there will be different, big differences in growth within the Eurozone? Uh, I think so, if I understand your argument correctly. Yeah. It, isn't that a big problem if you have different parts of, uh, of a uh, currency zone with completely different growth rates? Well, it will be if we don't allow greater mobility within the European Union. Um, no. So if we, don't, if we don't allow people to move more easily between states, and if we don't allow service uh, industries to uh, work across borders, if we don't implement a single digital market policy in order to let IT firms going to grow, yes, it's going to be hugely problematic, because then we get ultimately have, we will have huge effects on development of living standards in different parts of Europe, and that's not going to be good modeling going forward. So, you know, reforms mean letting resources flow there where it has the best and most productive applications. And that means that capital and labor needs to flow. Uh, and that will make then some areas richer and some areas poorer, but because of the openness, we will ultimately begin to catch up. It's, but my point is, you know, as economists here around the table, I think we're all agreed on that. The question is, how are we going to sell this to a very reluctant voter? And I just don't, you know, I, you know, I think most people in the room, I guess most of you are fairly pro-European, otherwise you wouldn't have come to this meeting, uh, would say, yeah, yeah, that you know, we kind of all agree. But the majority out there just doesn't think that they're going to benefit from it. Yeah. That's my problem. Because, I mean, really, mobility, it's possible to move in Europe. I mean, we, we have the free movement, so you can move and live and work with yeah. wherever you like. But whoever has tried it knows what the barriers are. <laughs> yeah, of course, there are barriers. But also, I mean, most people don't want to. They want to live, at least they don't want to move outside their own country. They want to speak their own language. Should we maybe have some questions from the audience as well? Are there any questions from the audience? Let's see. You're, you're mostly hungry now, I think. Yeah. Competing with love. If there aren't any questions from the audience, I'll just have something, something short. Um, how, much is, uh, how much is growth now affected by energy prices and oil prices are very high? Is this, has this a lower effect on the economy now than it had a few decades ago? Oh, well, that's a big question, and yeah. we will go way past lunch if, <laughs> if we would go deeply into this. Yeah. You know, I mean, movement of energy prices is an issue of all times, and, you know, our prices go up and down. So I don't think that's, that's the real issue. I mean, short term, there are always effects of rising oil prices, but they will come down at some point. The bigger issue is the, the massive changes that we're going to see in energy supply and demand around the world. And 
and again, what is happening to Europe in terms of its involvement in sort of global energy in the global energy markets is dramatic. Uh, the shale gas revolution in the U.S. Just to give you one example, the shale gas revolution in the U.S. has led to uh, declining prices of coal. The Americans are now massively exporting coal to uh, Europe, and Europe is increasing its CO2 emissions. And Americans are saying, you know, you see, I mean, we are actually reducing CO2 emissions. Your guys are increasing it. Uh, you know, with very good intentions, we have a, an energy policy in Germany that has hugely negative effects on the, on the rest of the European Union. So there is lack of good coordination about how these uh, uh, policies are going to work out. Um, other parts of the world are going to make investments in shale gas as well. In Europe, it's, it's hard because it's a very densely populated part of the world, but it's very unlikely that we'll be able to you know, move forward successfully in shale gas. And okay, we all like a renewable energy, but you know, I think all the scenarios are showing us that renewable energy, energy is a crucial part of energy policy in going forward. But it cannot do everything. You continue to need natural gas, you continue to need coal, and some people are arguing you will continue to need nuclear. Mm -hmm. And you may even have to increase it. So, so again, I think we need to have a much more constructive policy discussion in Europe. This is actually a European policy, much more than a state policy as well, uh, on energy policy. But is this a major problem, or is it further down the list? Maybe it's oh, I, well, so so the prices I don't see as a as a major issue. Although, no. but but the, the changes in in sort of global energy markets is a huge issue and perhaps one of the greatest uncertainties because without energy, there is very little we can do. But still, the most important is product market and labor market regulation. That's the biggest problem still. Well, I I wouldn't prioritize the one over the other. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, it's. Uh, Half past. Someone has short final comment. No. I, th I, I think that if yeah. we, if if Europe uh, actually a lot of countries do a lot of market uh, reforms, uh, I think that that if Bart is right, that is it. It is technology that is going to drive economic growth. Europe has a much better chance to actually catch up with the United States. An optimistic tone in the end. I like that. You know, as I said, I mean, uh, the, the growth recovery that we are seeing this year will help a little. But let's make sure that it is not just a pro-cyclical thing that will go away in a year or two. Yep. So there's a lot of work to be done. I may end up with a question. You know the saying, never waste a good crisis. You hardly dare to say that when you visit some countries. But have we done that? Or have we actually used it in a, in a future? Beneficial way. I think that will be a question I will take forward to to the last the last session when we talk about the political conclusions of of this day. Thank you very much. So it's uh, lunch. Uh, it's one hour lunch break. Um, so take your time to talk to each other, and uh, I'll see you back here at half past one.